Open in your Bibles to the opening chapter of a new series we are starting this morning, the book of Nehemiah. Chapter 1 of Nehemiah. We included, concluded a couple weeks ago a series through Haggai. We've been spending really the majority of this year in the Old Testament on purpose, wanting to study the story of God's Old Testament people, God's covenant people. We began all the way back in 1 Kings, way back in the spring, walked through 1 and 2 Kings, the story of the history of Israel, all the way up to the exile of Israel from the land, and then read about Haggai and the rebuilding of the temple, and now come to a time about 75 years later, well into the post-exile community, the book of Nehemiah. Have you ever had a, a moment where you encountered some story, maybe you, you read a book or you watched a movie, some story that you, you just loved, you just found it to be thrilling, you, you didn't want it to end, you got to the final chapter and you just think, oh, this is so good. Good. I, I don't want this to end. It's so satisfying and delightful, and it, it's such a fantastic story. And then, when at some future date somebody else references that story, your face lights up, and you say, Oh, yes, that is fantastic. Now, nobody does that better than my friend Mark Wally. Nobody does that better than Mark Wally. Mark is the best person I think I know at communicating exuberance at things he enjoys. Mark, if you find something that Mark enjoys, he will convince you that you must drop everything else and immediately go now and partake of this thing. Food, stories, movie, a site, a state, a park, it doesn't matter. It's one of my regular joys in life is to encounter Mark's latest thing of enthusiasm. Well, I am excited about this book. I am excited, and I can't do it, I, could, I should have had Mark up here just to kind of demonstrate how he would, uh, but I am excited about this book. This is just one of those stories that so communicates the greatness of God for His people, and it's meant to excite us. My, my hope is that as we preach it, as we study it again, and I'm sure many of you have read this before, that this would be one of those stories that would excite you not just excite you in that, oh, good, we get to go through Nehemiah, but it would, it would excite you and impact your life. It would impact our lives that the, the story of God's work in this moment in biblical history would impact God's, the view of God that we're to have of Him right now. So I, I pray that will be the case. I am looking forward to it. I pray that you can then have the same enthusiasm about this book and more importantly about the God behind this book as we read it. So this, this morning we're going to read the entirety of chapter 1 and then I'll comment on it. So Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa the citadel that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O oh Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. 
Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. Lord, bless the preaching of this story that you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Nehemiah is an extraordinary story of God's mercy and strength for his people, of restoring them from their downcast and low position and doing so by means of a faithful servant who is committed wholly to God's power and God's holiness. It's a story of restoration of revival, of resistance, of courage, of humility, and of supernatural victory, and, and not accidentally, it begins with a prayer. It begins with a prayer. When we began this year as a church, we said one of the themes we felt God was leading us to was an accent on prayer. We've sought to weave that through. We spent a number of weeks at the beginning of the year on prayer as a topic, but this book uh, refocuses us on that category of prayer because Nehemiah confronts the sad condition of God's people and instinctively what he does is to go to God in prayer. Now, there's two sections of this opening chapter. I'll just label them the report and then the prayer. Most of our time will be spent on the second section. Nehemiah who is in the citadel in the 20th year. This this would be, again, about 75 years after Haggai. So we're in the middle of the 400s B.C., okay? 400 years before the birth of Christ, 450 years or so. 445, roughly, is the date they think that these events took place. He's in Susa, which is the winter citadel of the Persian kings, okay? So the Persian Empire has dominion uh, from sea to sea, we might say, dominion over the land. And he is there, and we find out later he is a high, high-ranking official, a high-ranking personal official of the Persian king, and his brother, we don't know if it's his literal brother or just one of the brothers, comes from Judah, and he wants to know what is the condition of God's people. They had returned uh, many, many years before under the command of Cyrus that they return, he would have known likely of the rebuilding of the temple under Haggai, the successful rebuilding under Haggai and Zerubbabel and Jeshua even as reread about. But again, many, many decades have passed. He wants to know what's the condition of the people and of the city. And the report is not good. The remnant there in the province in verse 3 who had survived is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. Now, one might wonder why is Nehemiah surprised by this? Uh, Because obviously it was broken down because of the exile many, many years before. But it's likely if you read the book of Ezra, which is connected to this book, actually in the original Hebrew Bible, they were one book, two parts, one book. And then later on, Greek versions and other versions, they were separated into two books. But there's one one main story there in Ezra and Nehemiah. It's likely that sometime, some years before, there had begun to be an attempt to rebuild uh, the city and the walls outside, but at Xerxes, the Persian Empire, in response to requests from the people around the land, had forbidden that word from going forward. So it's possible that not only had they stopped the work, they had freshly destroyed whatever work had been done. So Nehemiah gets this report that even after decades, even after beginning a work to rebuild the city, the the walls are destroyed, its gates are broken down. And and we want to understand this in terms of the, the era in which they live. For the city of Jerusalem to be destroyed was a national catastrophe. It spelt a, a level of shame and helplessness for the inhabitants of the city. But more importantly, it 
communicated a theological disaster because this city above all others was <laughs> the symbol of God's conditions with his people. It was David's city. And this city was a, a symbol of how they were doing with God. And so if this city is destroyed, if the walls are broken down under the old covenant, that means that God's people are not experiencing the blessings of God's covenant in that Old Testament covenant. This is not just a, a bad day in Jerusalem. This is a bad day before God. And that's why Nehemiah is so discouraged. Even after all these years of exile, even after initial returns and promising rebuildings, the city is still destroyed. The promises of God for national prosperity, if His people will be faithful to follow Him, when he looks at the city, he sees nothing but devastation. Nothing but judgment, nothing but shame, nothing but helplessness. They have no ability to defend themselves against their enemies. A city without walls is a symbol of surrender in those days. They are, if I could put it this way, a new Jericho. Their walls have fallen down. They are defenseless and open to ridicule. They cannot protect themselves. And it seems God, though He has brought initial return with the temple building over decades, that has not brought any fulfillment of any kind of greater protection. That's the report. What does Nehemiah do with it? It's the main point I want to make this morning is that when, when we get reports about God's people, often in our day and age, we might hear them and they have a temporary effect on us, but they don't prompt us to do anything, because largely in the West, we are a self-centered people. We tend to think in terms of, how does this affect me? How does this affect my comfort? How does this affect my day-to-day -day concerns? And if it doesn't, we don't tend to do very much about it. Not so in the book of Nehemiah. One of the themes we're going to see in this book is an overwhelming concern for the state of God's people. Nehemiah will see in this prayer, he's not concerned just for him to be right with God. He wants God's people to be restored. He is dissatisfied with merely individual restoration. You, you, you notice that in this moment. As he gets this report, he doesn't just say, oh man, that's disappointing, and then move on with his successful life. That's not what he says, but doesn't that sound like something a modern-day Christian might say? Oh, that's disappointing. A, a leader falls to gross and immoral sin. Oh, that's, that's just disappointing, and it's forgotten in moments. Oh, the church is declining theologically. Oh, that's disappointing. It's forgotten by lunch. How, how different... A heart for God's people, let alone those who say, I love following Jesus and I don't really care much about what happens in the church. How different Nehemiah is. Nehemiah is very concerned about the condition of God's people. He is, how many miles? Miles and miles and miles and miles and miles away, traveling. It would take him forever to get to Jerusalem, but his heart is towards the well-being of God's people. The well-being of God's reputation trumps any concern about his own comfort. There's something to learn and be motivated by about this book that is so concerned. And, and yet, that concern doesn't begin with action. It begins with prayer. It begins with prayer and begins with a particular kind of prayer. Let's move into that next section. I want us to notice how Nehemiah prays. This is effectively a prayer of contrition. I like that word, contrition. It's not a word we use very often. It's a good word. Contrition, a contriteness, a, a godly grief over sin colors this prayer. He begins the prayer, verse 4, as soon as he hears these words, he sits down and he weeps. You notice the depth of his heart for God's honor and God's people. He mourns, not just temporarily. He doesn't have a sad, downer moment 
He has days worth of mourning, and he's not just going to feel sad. He's going to express that sadness with fasting and prayer. Fasting is consistently used in the Bible as a way of expressing a longing for something that you want more of or you want God to do. It's a way of saying to God, I care more about this thing I want you to do than I even care about eating. I I so care about this thing I want you to do that I want to demonstrate that to you by not eating. This is how deeply I long for this thing. That's how fasting is consistently used in the Bible. It's It's a discipline that expresses to God, I care more about you than I care about this thing. That's how deeply Nehemiah cares about the well-being of God's people and this disaster that their continued judgment in exile reveals about their status with God. So he continues for days, fasting and praying. Actually, we find out, based on the timing of the month of chapter 2, that he's still sad. And so commentators presume, and I think rightly, he probably was praying for multiple months. Because the next chapter 2, when we read about that, that's several months later, at least three months later that he's been praying and grieving over the state of God's people, so much so that the king even notices. Again, we need to be provoked by the way God moves in his people. The way God moves in his people to restore them is through contrite prayer. God restores through contrition. That's a theme we see throughout the Bible. God restores through contrition. Now, I want to encourage us, as I've said before, often we read the Old Testament, we're instinctively looking for the hero we're supposed to emulate, but often it's the case that it's better to describe the passage in terms of what does this reveal about how God works in his people. Not so much be like Nehemiah, but what does this reveal in Nehemiah that shows something about how God chooses to work? Those reading this would know the end of the story, so they would see this prayer of contrition as a way of God revealing, here's how I work. If you want to know what precedes restoration and revival, it's prayers like this. It's prayers of contrition. It's prayers that are outside of our self-centered focus. It's prayers that are not just focused on ourselves. and if they are, they are contrite prayers, but they are looking to the honor of God, the good of his people, and they are contrite prayers aware of the holiness of God and yet also laying claim on his promises of steadfast love. Notice that about the prayer. He's mourning, but his prayer begins with references to God's character. Look down there at your Bible. Look at verse 5. It says, O Lord God of heaven. So he's referencing God's greatness, the great and awesome God, but he's also referencing God's character. You, You are the God who keeps covenant and steadfast love. You are the chesed God. You keep steadfast love. You keep your commandments. So his His grief doesn't distract him from the character and the love of God. Very important point, because sometimes we confuse worldly grief, which is a sadness about circumstances, and often doesn't have God in view, with godly grief, which is aware of God's character even as we mourn over the effects of our sin. Very important difference. Very easy to be sad about the circumstances or the consequences of even sin, even our sin or our exposure. That's not godly grief. Godly grief has a firm view on God's character, God's greatness, God's steadfast love. It has an underlying satisfaction in God even as it is, as it is mourning and longing for God to do something powerful based on His love. There's a lesson for us there, even as we deal with our own sin, that there is a difference between being embarrassed by exposure and being convicted by God. Very important difference. I would say this specifically to teenagers, because I think this is a real risk for teenagers especially, but it's really a risk for all of us. There is a difference between embarrassment by exposure of our sin or our failure and grief that we have sinned against God. Embarrassment is focused on our reputation. Godly grief is focused on our sin against the Lord. 
Nehemiah ex- exemplifies this. And how do we know that? Because his heart is fixed on God's character. He's not concerned about what people think of him. He's concerned about what has happened between God and his people that has brought the situation is about. He is fixed on God's character. And he is pleading with God to hear his prayer. Notice also that conviction, biblical conviction, always leads toward God, not away from him. Notice that. Nehemiah doesn't attempt to fix everything before he goes to God. He goes to God. And we know that God honors this way of approaching him because of what happens in the rest of the story. God is not saying to people, fix yourselves and then I'll talk to you. He's saying, come talk to me so that I can fix you. Very important difference. Come first and then you can change. How easy to think. I've got so many things wrong with me. I need to fix those things and then I can go to God and start praying about it. Not the way the Bible exhorts us to be, here or elsewhere. Come to God And in that conviction, and that is humbling to come to God in our failure, in our weakness, in our inability, in our ongoing struggle, come first, then receive the power to change. That's the mercy of God. He invites sinners, not the self-righteous. He invites sinners to come. He invites Nehemiah to come. That's the point. God works through the contrition of his people. As they come to him, that's what Nehemiah does. He comes, he says, let your ears be attentive. Listen to me, Lord. Listen to me and listen to what he prays. I am, in notice there at the end of verse 6, I am confessing the sins of the people of Israel which we have sinned before you. And notice he doesn't set himself apart. He puts himself right there. He stands with the people. I and my father's house also have sinned. That there is a way at times in the West, and preachers do this too, so I count myself among them. There's a way in which we can talk about the sins of the land and hold ourselves apart from them. Oh, this is the, the land. It's just full of sin and sinners. Those sinners. I can't believe these sinners. How terrible. Can you believe the culture? But Nehemiah puts himself, he identifies himself. He's mostly concerned about his own contributions, even as he's aware that also the people around him have sinned. Now, a very important caveat here we need to make. It is not always the case that practical calamity can be directly ascribed to sin, okay? We want to make that case very clearly. It's not like when somebody is sick, their instant thought should be, well, it's because I've sinned. No, we know from Job, we know from Joseph that sometimes God allows those people to suffer who have not directly contributed to that suffering. So I don't want you to get the wrong message here. But in this case, God had unequivocally declared that this exile was a result of their rebellion. There was no question in this case. This wasn't like, well, that's interesting why my cart broke down. Is that my sin or God's providence? I don't know. No, 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 no. The exile, had God had said, you are going into exile because you have rebelled against me. That's why your city is broken down, because I am fulfilling the promises I made that if you rejected me, even as we read through generation after generation in First and Second Kings, this is what will happen. So Nehemiah isn't jumping to the wrong conclusion here. He's jumping to the right conclusion that it is because of our sins that the city is in this terrible state. He says, we've acted corruptly. Notice notice Nehemiah is uh, unaffected by modern concerns about not feeling too bad about what's happened. He doesn't seem to be a guy that's overly sensitive. I don't want you to feel too bad. No, Nehemiah is saying, no, I want to feel this is bad. This is very bad. Guilt is supposed to feel bad. Condemnation feels hopeless. Guilt feels bad. Don't confuse the two. Condemnation is hopeless. It's badness with no hope and nowhere to go. Guilt guilt feels bad because sin is bad. Sin is bad. But sometimes in our great celebrating culture, we think that the bad feeling of guilt must automatically be condemnation. No, it's not. No, it's not. It feels bad because it is bad. 
Sin is bad. It's not supposed to feel good. It's not supposed to be whitewashed over. It's not a termite-ridden house that you paint and feel good about. That's not what sin is. Sin is supposed to feel bad, but it's supposed to feel bad in the context of going to God for hope. So Nehemiah says, we have acted very corruptly. And we've read First and Second Kings, and we have to say, yes, that's true. Very corruptly. And isn't that true of our own hearts? Very corruptly against the commandments that Moses gave us in verse 7. So he's contrite. He's acknowledging the evil that led to this moment. He's saying this disaster could have been avoided if only we'd been trusting of our God and faithful to the covenant that he gave to Moses. The reason we have all this is because we rejected God. We trusted the Baals, and they proved worthless against the invasion of the Babylonians. And now we live under the rule of the Persians. We can't even build our own walls in the city. How, how bad has our sin led us to this terrible place? But he doesn't stop at his confession. He moves towards bringing to God's remembrance a covenant that includes mercy. Notice verse 8. Remember. Remember the word you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you. He's saying, yes, I, you have done that. You have been faithful to that word. But Lord, I'd like to remind you of another word in the same covenant, I'd like to remind you of another word. You were certainly faithful. You have done that. You have proven your faithfulness to judge those who reject you. I believe you, he, so, he says. In an odd way, we can also almost find hope in the judgments of the Old Testament because it shows God does what he says. And so, therefore, we can trust that those who come to him for mercy, God will likewise do what he says. So he comes and he says, you have done that. You have scattered them the way you said. But remember you said, if you return to me in verse 9 and keep my commandments and do them, if you come back, if I could put it this way, into the covenant, though they are in the uttermost parts of heaven, I will gather them and bring them to the place I have chosen. And then he goes even further. And he says, they are your servants and your people whom you redeemed. He calls back to bind Moses and the Exodus. He says, you, you redeemed them by your great power and your strong hand. What, what's he doing? He's saying, Lord, we've sinned. I have no right in myself to claim your mercy. I'm not basing my, my request for your mercy on having a better week. That's not what I'm praying. Like, I know we were bad, but if you'll notice this week, it's been really good. No, that's not what I'm doing. I got nothing to bring you but my sin and that you promise to be merciful. And I'm bringing that to you. I'm bringing your promise to be merciful. You said if we come back to you, you, you would gather us again. And I'm laying claim on that, and I'm doing one better. I'm reminding you that these are your people. He's basically saying, Lord, do it for your own reputation. Do it for your own glory. Do it, pr Lord, here, here, here are those servants, me and some others, who do delight to fear your name. So show how you relate to those who come to you in fear and in worship. Demonstrate your power to those who are entrusting themselves again to you. Do it, Lord. It's very similar to the prayer Moses prayed, and I think it's intentional it's very similar to the prayer Moses prayed when the people, after they were delivered from Egypt, had rebelled against God, and God said, I am leaving them in the desert. You take them in. I will not be here with them anymore. And Moses said, if you depart from us, what makes us distinct? It's only in your being with us that we are your people in all the earth. And God says, I will go with you in response to Moses' prayer. Nehemiah prays something similar. Moses prayed, if you send them away from here, people will say God couldn't deliver them. He basically appeals to God's own glory and reputation and says, you must defend your own glory by showing mercy to this rebellious people. Nehemiah does the same thing. Lord, these are, these are your servants, rebellious yet, yes, but returning now. Show the truthfulness of your mercy. 
I want us to notice that prayers of contrition are not hopeless prayers. They're not godless prayers. They're not ambivalent, superficial prayers. They are deeply contrite, deeply sorrowful, and yet hopeful and laying claim on God's mercy kinds of prayers. This is an incredible model for what a faithful believer should do when he sees in his own life or in the lives of God's people a rebellion. He, he ought to see in this, and the Israelites reading this would have seen in this, a model for what it looks like. Lay claim on God's character, draw near to God in honest confession of the true sinfulness of our sin, and also lay claim on God's own glory as the cause or motive for his bringing mercy to rebellious people. God restores through contrition that calls on His covenant. God restores through contrition that calls on His covenant. It happens here. It happens elsewhere in the Old Testament. God restores. Yes, He does. How? Through contrition. Any kind of contrition? No. Contrition that calls on His covenant. You notice that just contrition in general in the Old Testament doesn't do anything. You remember those prophets of Baal who were wailing before Baal, cutting themselves. They're very contrite in in one sense, especially after they were all day. I bet they were really contrite. They, They were very contrite. They're bleeding and everything. That means nothing to God. God is not impressed with religious sincerity. Let me respectfully disagree with C.S. Lewis. He is not impressed with mere religious sincerity that does not lay claim on his covenant. God has revealed himself a particular way. Contrition, yes, but contrition that lays claim on God and his promises, not mere contrition. And that's true for Christians. God will surely look on my grief. My grief is self-atoning. No, it's not. You can't grieve yourself into a place of being justified before God. You can't. Your grief doesn't pay for sin. You can grieve and you can go to God who forgives grieving sinners. Notice the model here that this is for us. Notice the model. What's God saying to the people, the Israelites, who would have read this who would have read this story many, many decades later. They're reading about Nehemiah. What's what's the purpose of, what's this supposed to get done in them? Well, surely one of the things that's supposed to get done is we, we, we need to follow this faithful Israelite and be contrite about our current sins and also lay claim on God's character and covenant. They would have still been living under the law of Moses. Christ hadn't come yet. And so they, they need... They need, if they're reading this, yes, let's, what, what are we currently seeing? That we ought to be going to God, not hopelessly, but contritely. Where do we need to mourn and grieve truly, not superficially, for areas of sin and worldliness and ungodliness in our current life? Where do we need to lay claim on God's mercy, trusting that God will be faithful to His promise? Where, where do we need to do that? Let's follow in the footsteps of this faithful Israelite who is showing for us the path to God's restoration. What did Nehemiah do that led to the glorious scenes that come in this story? He prayed contritely, confessing the covenant promises. That's what he did. And that's what they should do. Now, what do we do today? We don't live under the law of Moses. What do we do? What do we do? Is this just a nice old story? No. It has authoritative relevance for us And though we don't live under the Old Testament covenant, we live under the same God who has the same character as he always has and revealed that character in that covenant and still extends that character to us in Christ. So we also, we also should learn from this faithful believer so that when we see the calamity caused by our sin. We're not building up the walls of Jerusalem, but we do see broken down things in our lives that we know are a result of sin, that we can clearly identify, yes, that's, that's a broken down area of sin in my life. And we, like Nehemiah, can say, Lord, we, we have sinned. 
Christians are those that can stare with hope at the reality of their sin. They're not afraid of it. They're not trying to hide it. They're not trying to make up for it. They can share honestly the reality of their sin. They're able to do that, like Nehemiah. They're able to grieve. Lord, look at this area in my life. Look at the state of your people of which I am one. Look, look at the apathy. Look at the listlessness. Look at the worldliness. Look at the lust. Look at the bitterness. Look at the anger. Look at the idolatry. Lord, look at these areas in my life. Lord, I confess they are sinful before you. They are corrupt before you. And Lord, you are the great and awesome God, and you keep your word, and I have not kept mine. My word expressed in baptism was to obey you all of my days. And I have not done that faithfully, perfectly. No, I haven't. There are many ways where I have acted corruptly. And yet my confidence in baptism and in your word is that you are my Lord and Savior. And so I come to you in this new covenant for your mercy. Lord, show mercy. Show the power of your name. Restore. As we pray contritely before you, as we mourn, truly mourn, our sin, our impatience, our self-righteousness, our latest sinful conflict, our apathy, our laziness, our worldliness, our greed, as we contritely share whatever is true of us before you, we also pray, Lord, Lord, demonstrate the promises of your mercy in my life. Show the truth of what you have promised. Show it, Lord. Show it, Lord, for your glory. May, may my sin... My sin be the, the opportunity for you to show how merciful you are. I, I won't sin so that grace may increase, but having sinned, I will celebrate the glory of grace. May, may this moment of confession be the opportunity for you to show your mercy. So what do we do? We believe that God works through contrition to bring restoration. God works, now this is a principle, I just want to fix this in our mind. God works through contrition to bring restoration. Now it's possible that in God's people there is an indifference to restoration so that we aren't contrite because we don't care about God's people being restored to greater areas of godliness. We don't care about our own heart being restored. We're comfortable living in Susa without a care in the world about the state of our heart or the state of the church. May it not be. You have to care about God's glory to care whether you're breaking it. But if we care about God's glory, the next thing that will happen is we care about breaking it. And the next thing that will happen is we are contrite about where we have broken it. And the next thing that will happen is we want to show God's glory as he gives mercy. And he restores his people through contrition. God restores through contrition. One of the things the Bible always revealed in the Old Testament, how does God work towards his people? I, I don't recommend reading the Old Testament mostly looking for heroes to emulate. Now, Nehemiah is a hero, and we emulate him at some level, but the, the story begins with this question, how does God work in the life of his people? And that's where we start understanding the relevance Old Testament stories to today. How does God work in the life of his people? Well, he works to restore through contrition. Genuine contrition. Hopeful contrition, but contrition. God restores through contrition. But the second thing, this will be my last application point. The second thing is that God works through the intercession of his servant leader to bring restoration. Both of these things are true in this story. So two application points. God works through the contrition of his people to bring restoration. Good point for us to apply in our own lives. But there's a secondary application here, and I have to admit, it is glorious. God works through the intercession of his servant leader to bring restoration. 
Should the average Israelite and the average Christian see in Nehemiah's prayer something to emulate? Yes, I believe we should. Nehemiah is a fellow sinner, as he admits, and his example was meant to lead, and even throughout the book, it's meant to affect the fellow Israelites, and even today, the fellow believers. Yes, it it is an example, but it's also worth noting, there's only one Nehemiah. (laughs) Yes, there are other people praying, but this guy was incredible. He was incredible. And one of the things that surely believers reading this decades later would have thought is, wow, we need a guy like Nehemiah. Man, we need It's not that they would all think, let's all be Nehemiahs. In a small way, sure. But I think that's more of an American way of thinking. Let's all be Davids. Let's all be Nehemiah. I'm going to be a modern Moses. No, you're not. No, you're not. Your best is not going to be Moses, and it's not going to be Nehemiah. Can you be like them? Sure, in some smaller way. Yes, let's learn absolutely. You know, we're more like, we're like the people Nehemiah was praying for. We're like the people Nehemiah was praying for. And it is not accidental that Nehemiah's prayer echoes and copies Moses' prayer and Solomon's prayer on behalf of God's people. Were they supposed to emulate that? Yes, yes. Not just one application. But it is also on purpose that God's people reading this would think that is the kind of leader we need. A leader who stands in the gap for God's people, who carries their sins before God, and who prays God's covenant for them. They would want that kind of leader. One application, they would long for that. Lord, give us, give us another Nehemiah. Those reading this 70 years later, 385 or so B.C., those reading this, 200 B.C., Lord, give us another Nehemiah. Yes, we'll try to be like him, but we need him. We need someone like him, that your power works through him, that through his intercession you answered his prayers, that he carried our sins before you, that you responded, that you were merciful, that you restored us, not just through general contrition, but through this intercessory prayer of this individual that is your servant leader. And when you read this book and think about this prayer that way, if we know the New Testament, you should know where I'm going. Who is the greatest intercessor for God's people? Who carries their sins before God? Who brought about a new covenant where the exiles could be gathered home? Who? Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus. One of the dangers of thinking of everybody's a Nehemiah kind of Old Testament reading is that you miss the way certain leaders are meant in their imperfect way to point forward to Christ. Should all of us be like David and fight the Goliaths of our day? Yes, in a sense, but in a greater way. There is one giant slayer who rescues us, the cowering soldiers. Should all of us go before God ultimately and intercede for his people? Yes, but there is one great interceder. There is one great person who carries the sins of God's people and brings about God's covenant. It is Christ. It's actually what we read in Hebrews 7 when the writer says, consequently he, Christ, is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. What this prayer should do is motivate us to pray and motivate us to glory in Christ. Romans 8.33 says the same thing. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Why? Ultimately, because of the perfection of our contrite prayers, 
No. No, though that is good to do. No. Why? Because Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. You know what some random person in Israel did not know at that moment? There is somebody praying for me that God is going to use to restore my life. And you know what you didn't know before you were saved? There is somebody who is looking out for me that is going to restore my life, that is going to gather me from my far reaches of sin. There is somebody, even now, when you're going through your days and you're aware of the imperfections of your life and even the imperfections of your contrition, there is somebody interceding for you, and he's even better than Nehemiah. Nehemiah had his own sin he had to confess, but there is one who had none of his own sin to confess and only ours. There is one, there is one who didn't just restore Moses' covenant, but brought in a better one with better promises. There is one who didn't just restore a physical city, but brings us a city made without hands, unshakable in the heavens. There is one, there is one who restores God's people to the end. And Nehemiah, in his wonderful way, imperfect but clear way, is reminding us, yeah, yeah, intercede like Nehemiah. Absolutely, he's a fellow sinner, but he was given a role. And that role, ultimately, it points us to an even greater leader who intercedes for us. An even greater covenant than the covenant of Moses. An even greater promise than the promise of a rebuilt wall. An even greater hope than the hope of bringing back exiles to one specific location in the Middle East. A hope of gathering people from every tribe and nation into one glorious kingdom, into a city that cannot be shaken, where there will be no more sin to confess and only the glories of God's redemption to celebrate. Now that, that's why this is a great story. It's a great story in its own right, but it's an even better story when we think about what it points us forward to. God restores his people through their contrition, ultimately, as they place confidence in Christ. God restores his people through their contrition, yes, but ultimately, as they place their confidence in Christ who is interceding for them. Let me encourage you. You are going to sin this week. That's not the encouragement. You are going, <laughs> you are going to sin this week. Nehemiah 1 should tell you, go to the Lord in contrition and remember, you have a better covenant to plead before God. And even when you don't know what to pray for as you ought, he is praying for you. He represents you before God. When you sin this week, go to Christ, who is even now praying for us, and lay claim again on the mercy he has purchased. Christ will never refuse the sinner who comes to him. He will carry us before God and grant to us the mercy that is beyond imagination. Contrition, yes, in Christ. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give you all the glory for your kindness in sending your son to stand in the gap for us. And Lord, we do humble ourselves, Lord, for our stubborn sins, the sins we know about, the sins that are even now concealed from us. Lord, we bring them to you. Lord, teach us to be godly grievers over our sin. Teach us not to whitewash it. Teach us not to assume it's superficial.
But Lord, teach us also to be hopeful even as we confess, full of hope because we have an even better one interceding for us. Let us be contrite with our confidence in you. Lord, do that for every individual here today in Jesus' name.